We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. A world this is multipolarity, charting the rise of the new multipolar world order. Coming up this week, Mexico has a new president. She's the first woman president. She's the first Jewish president. But most importantly, she's the second Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador president. As the outgoing leader's hand-picked successor takes over, what does the continuity version of his wily non-orthodox socialism look like when it comes to Mexico's global standing? Meanwhile, for once, America's not going for a Mexican. It's going for a British. The world's least fashionable takeaway destination is also presently the world's most underpriced stock market. As American money swoops in, it's not clear whether they'll leave the bones. Finally, news is that Turkey is drifting ever closer to BRICS membership. NATO's most fragile member seems to be ever farther out of alignment with the West. It's certainly the dawning of a golden age of multipolarity. But will it improve the acronym? But first... Madame El Presidente. So, election season is upon us. Lots of hype about the forthcoming British election, the American election, the European elections, various European national elections. Mexico has also had an election. And it is quite a big deal, I think it's fair to say, because the winner was Claudia Scheinbaum, the first female president of Mexico, and the first Jewish president of Mexico. She was the selected successor of the sitting president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, who goes by the moniker MLO. It is a little bit easier than the full name. Uh, she has an impressive CV. She was a PhD in engineer, energy engineering. Uh, she completed her PhD at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California. She was also the mayor of Mexico City. And she's very much seen as the continuity candidate. And because she was seen as the continuity candidate, uh, she won by an absolute landslide because AMLO is an ultra-popular political figure. He has gained a huge amount of popularity during his six-year tenure as a Mexican president. And Ms. Scheinbaum won resoundingly. She gathered around approximately uh, 60% of the vote. And that was th more than 30 percentage points higher than the second place contender and uh, 50 percentage points ahead of the third place. I mean, she absolutely thrashed everybody. The question here is twofold. What did AMLO do to make hi himself so popular and make his, his, his party so popular? And given... Um, Ms. Scheinbaum is the continuity candidate, or was the continuity candidate, and is now the continuity president, or soon will be. Can she repeat the trick? Well, what did MLO do? He engaged on a program of government, a, 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 a left wing program of government that would be very familiar to anybody who rem remembers the 1970s, actually. It was basically left wing nationalism. Uh, it involved raising the minimum wage. It involved getting rid of outsourcing. It involved dem democratizing unions, increasing the amount of paid holiday leave that workers were entitled to. It involved uh, social welfare transfers to the poor, uh, greater taxation of corporations, all of these sorts of things. We'll get onto some of the more contentious issues in a little while, but... Basically, <laughs> whatever you think about that kind of left-wing nationalism, it was a, re a resounding success. Five million Mexicans were lifted out of poverty. Unemployment declined. The, the kind of the fruits of, of wealth creation were distributed a lot more evenly because the country's Gini coefficient, which is a coefficient often used by organizations like the World Bank and the IMF and the OECD to measure inequality within specific countries declined markedly. And because of this, he had a great deal of pop popularity. He was tremendously popular in the country. And this is the wave that Claudia Scheinbaum has, has, uh, has ridden to secure a resounding election victory. 
The big question is, and I think the big news story is here, though, that in a sense, whether Ms. Scheinbaum will be successful as a president doesn't necessarily hang on whether she can continue this degree of popularity, but it hangs on whether she can handle a, a, an array of de- that, that, that that Mexico has or MLO had with the United States. Now, those listeners who do remember the 70s or, or, or do know a little bit about the 70s and the way that the U.S. engaged with Latin America will know that traditionally the U.S. does not like Latin American governments that turn left-wing <laughs> Is the same thing happening here? Well, maybe, but not quite. It's not quite the same. It's not quite that that fear of the Soviets getting a foothold in Monroe Doctrine territory. It's a little bit more kind of case by case on that. And uh, and the U.S. did have a series of trade, uh, a series of disputes. For instance, the big one and uh, or, or the or the one that's most prominent was that the U.S. is really getting frustrated with the flow of narcotics, what we Brits would call drugs, across the border into the United States. And that was one area that AMLO conspicuously failed. He didn't get a grip on the cartels. He didn't really get a grip on things like the murder rate in Mexico. And the US is getting increasingly frustrated. We on this podcast covered last year um, a group of senators who wanted to declare the cartels as terrorist organizations, which would give the president of the US the legal authorization to use military force to deal with them. So imagine that. Imagine the US using military force in Mexico, irrespective of what the Mexican president, the sovereign government of Mexico thought about that. I mean, that's how that's how far this has deteriorated, especially driven by the explosion of fentanyl deaths in the United States. But that's not all. Through AMLO's left-wing economic program, he also courted disputes with the US. For instance, he brought the energy sector under public national control, whereas in in the past, energy generation had been run, in part at least, by private organizations. And there was a huge and long-running dispute with the U.S. with regard to the ability of private organizations or private companies to actually compete with new publicly-run energy utilities in Mexico. And that was something that was even taken up through the NAFTA organization, the organization that runs the free trade zone uh, between Mexico, Canada, and uh, the United States. Something similar has happened with genetically modified crops. The AMLO government wanted to ban such genetically modified crops, because, especially since they had an effect on the local indigenous strains of maize, which are very much part not just of the Mexican food chain, where, you know, where it's the kind of the linchpin of Mexican food, especially for the poor, but maize and corn is, is very much part of the you know, the Mexican culture and history. And AMLO wanted to protect that from the new genetically modified strains. The big agri concerns in the US, though, said, ah, ah, this goes against kind of NAFTA rules. So there's another dispute. There have also been disputes related to Mexico's relation with China, and especially in relation to its position as a trade intermediary between the United States and China, Again, more recently, we've discussed this insofar as we've talked about the Biden administration's tariffs on China and whether in the end it's going to end up as a game of whack-a-mole where China just, say, sets up in Mexico, and if that doesn't work out, then Colombia and Vietnam. And the Americans are you know, really putting pressure on Mexico to take the side of the U.S. in this trade war, whereas Mexico would really quite like to continue profiting from its trade relationship with China. China is now its second biggest trading partner. It doesn't want to cut that off. There were also issues with relation to the alteration to Mexico's mining laws. Mexico, people might not realize, it's a pretty big country in terms of mining and extractive industries. And in the past, 
it had really favorable laws for multinational mining companies to come and start mining uh, Mexico's minerals and, and metals and all of the rest of it. AMLO changed that and, and, and made it more favorable to labor, more favorable to the Mexican treasury as well. There's also issues with migration across the U.S. southern border, as everyone knows. And there's even been issues, tensions, with regards to Mexico's neutrality. Mexico is constitutionally a neutral country in a similar way to uh, Switzerland or the Republic of Ireland or in, in previous years, Sweden, obviously no longer. But that has irked the U.S. as well when it comes to Ukraine, for example. In all of these areas, there are there, there are running and quite major disputes in mining, GM crops, migration, drug smuggling, relations with China, the energy system. All of these things there are there, there, there are disputes with the U.S. We shouldn't forget that the U.S. is is much bigger and more powerful than Mexico. I don't think any of us who would claim to be experts on the Mexican domestic political scene or the Mexican economy or anything like that, it does feel as if a lot of Ms. Scheinbaum's you know, potential to be a successful or an, an unsuccessful president might come down to how she manages relationships with America because AMLO managed to ignore this or rebuff it or somehow get around it all and, and do what he wanted to do anyway. Will Ms. Scheinbaum? That's an open question, and I think this is important because the relation be between the U.S. and Mexico is more important than it might seem from the outside. The reaction to the Mexican election has been completely bizarre. I think probably because of some of the issues that you've highlighted. Like it's, I guess it's quite complicated in a way, but I think the way I'd summarize it is America currently doesn't really know what to think of Mexico or the direction it's heading in, frankly, the direction the United States is heading in. Just to give some kind of market news on this, after the election, the S&P Mexico Bolsa Index, that's the stock index for Mexico, fell 10% in dollar terms, which is the third greatest decline in the index in the last 20 years, the other two being COVID-19 and the global financial crisis. So this was the biggest, th th there was a bigger shock to the American stock market after Scheinbaum's election than there was when Trump was elected in 2016. And remember when Trump was elected in 2016, he said he was going to build a wall. He kind of hinted at shutting down NAFTA and all this kind of thing. So apparently markets have been more spooked by Scheinbaum's election than by Trump's when he was talking a big game against Mexico. The, the Mexican peso fell as well, significantly. And I, I don't really know what to make of this. I mean, look, I, I used to work in markets, obviously, and I, I did see that there was a tendency of markets to sell off when uh, left-wing leaders are elected in Latin America. I always found it mystifying. I mean, I remember when um, uh, President Lula was elected in Brazil, I think the second time, a market sold off. And I kind of looked at the track record of President Lula in his first term, I think I'm getting this right. And it was like, fine, he was a pretty normal president. And Brazil was growing like really fast under the first Lula administration. And there was no issues with kind of, quote unquote, socialism or whatever. And yet the market still sold off. And I just thought from a purely economic point of view, I don't really get this. I do more so get it when there's kind of an election in maybe Argentina, although the incumbent president there, the arch libertarian Javier Malay, is giving the socialists a run for their money in terms of creating hyperinflation. So clearly, clearly just voting left or right doesn't actually doesn't actually matter as much as, as, as the structural issues. So I, I don't really know what to make of it. I mean, I kind of riff off what you were saying about the, the China relationship and so on. That's a double-edged sword, because as you said, um, China seems to be pouring more money into Mexico to get around the trade restrictions and so on. Um, there was actually another article on that uh, out this week in the Financial Times, where it showed that Chinese investment was pouring into Vietnam and Mexico. And the article, for the first time, as far as I know, in the mainstream financial press, or at least in the Financial Times, highlighted the connection that we've been discussing on the show for quite some time now, that these that what's going on here is basically China are just re-exporting through these markets. Now, I think we've mentioned on the show before that one of the um one of the things rumored to be being built in Mexico is a BYD factory with the backing of Warren Buffett. 
But if Warren Buffett's backing something, Warren Buffett's pretty close to the Democrat Party and to the establishment, and he's pals with Bill Gates, and like everyone kind of knows that scene. If Warren Buffett's doing that, it's probably getting a sly wink and a nod. So I always thought that basically the American business community were kind of trying to get around probably some of what they saw as the excesses of what was going on in D.C. And Mexico, it seemed to me, because of their position in NAFTA, was always going to be a key plank on that. So I, I, I have to say, I don't really understand this market reaction. And it feels to me like it's the markets are confused. We've said it, I've said it a million times on the show before. I don't think markets are very good at geopolitics. The main reason for this is because historically, you haven't had to pay any attention to geopolitics. And now that you have to pay attention to geopolitics, the markets tend to get confused. So I'd read it in that vein. But the last thing I'll say, because it's one to watch, over the past year and a half or year, or maybe two years, I think it's probably a year and a half, the AMLO government, the Lopez Obrador government, has constantly been denying rumors that they're considering joining the BRICS. Now, I'm not saying that the Mexico is going to join the BRICS anytime soon, but the reason they keep denying rumors is quite simple. Because if you abstract from the fact that Mexico has a very tight t- trade relationship with the United States and is on the border of the United States, and the United States is obviously a major power, if you abstract from that, it would be very much in the interest of Mexico to join the BRICS. And so the reason I think they're denying these rumors so consistently is because you're, if you're sitting in the Mexican government, and by government, I don't mean in the parliament, I mean in the state. If you're in the state apparatus in Mexico, you are looking at this BRICS thing, and it's coming to Latin America, and you're looking at all the Chinese investment that's coming in at the moment. And you're also thinking about the, frankly, strained historical relationships you've had with your major trading partner, which is the United States. There's a lot of ill feeling in Mexico about many different things, territorial disputes, wars, so on, that have gone out throughout, throughout history that have not been forgotten. You're looking at all that and you're going, geez, the BRICS actually looks pretty interesting. Now, of course, there's constraints on it. That's why they keep denying the rumors. But I wonder if some of the nervousness isn't that this, that as you say, Scheinbaum election, which she obviously did very well, as you said, is, is showing that Mexico is going in one direction. And if they keep going in that direction, at a certain point, they have to look at Brazil and Argentina until Malay took over and say, is this BRICS thing viable? Do we want to jump on board with it? Can we negotiate a position of of being in, in a trade block, perhaps, without annoying the Americans and so on? I wonder if some of that's showing through in the market moves. But generally speaking, it just feels to me that the markets are confused by the geopolitical turmoil. It seems very strange that the markets would shift in that way after she was elected. After all, AMLO was very popular. She was his chosen successor, even though she won a resounding victory, uh, the election isn't far beyond where AMLO was in terms of his popularity ratings, right? I mean, so it kind of come as a shock to the market. Surely they were already pricing this in. One reason that they might be worried is because it also looks like uh, Ms. Scheinbaum's party is going to get within the Mexican legislature a majority big enough to make constitutional changes, um, as people might know, in, in in most countries with a written constitution, the constitution can be amended or added to uh, if there is some kind of supermajority of the legislature uh, in favor of said amendment or addition. And it looks as though Ms. Scheinbaum's party is going to secure a, uh, a majority large enough to do that. So they might be concerned that you know she's going to supercharge this kind of you know, traditional left-wing nationalist uh, economic program, and there might be further losses to be had for uh, multinational companies from that. But, I, I mean, to give an example, it's not like they're expropriating. I think I'm right in saying that British listeners will have some sympathy with this, but the you know Mexico is involved in uh, PFI uh, deals, PFI private finance initiatives, where basically – you invite private investment into the public sector and pay you know a you know a long term and healthy interest rate back in exchange for that investment it, you know one of the issues that the british have with funding the nhs is we 
during the Blair and Brown government, we got engaged, and also the Cameron government, we got engaged in a range of these PFI uh, deals. And the interest that you have to pay on them is like huge in the end. It, you know, it seems to make sense. Let's get private investment involved. We'll get the private sector involved. We'll raise all this money. We'll be able to inject capital. We'll be able to inject capital. But it turns out that it's a super expensive way of doing things. Now, AMLO decided, no, I've had enough of this. I want to get out of them. So he did unilaterally break the contract. But I believe I'm right in saying that he did pay these companies a fair market rate for their assets. It wasn't just like he did the traditional kind of socialist far left thing of saying, that's ours now, buddy. But he did actually pay them a reasonable uh, market rate for what their assets were worth. And, you know, he said he wanted to maintain as good relationships as he possibly could with these organizations. I, 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 don't, I don't want to put too much of a shine on what he did because I know that sort of thing is very much frowned upon. I think, though, what's interesting about this is there's a certain wave of populism that's sweeping across South America at the moment. And some of it actually is being very effective in, 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 in improving the life, the lives of South Americans, of Latin Americans. So one is Naib Bukele in El Salvador. Uh, another has been MLO. You know, whatever you think of his policies, he's lifted millions of Mexicans out of poverty. He has reduced inequality. He has improved living standards drastically. He has given... In individuals more more of a uh, more power within society and you may not agree with the way he did that but you, you must be able to understand why it's popular equally bukele has in el salvador has engaged in some let's be honest really harsh and authoritarian measures to deal with the crime problems in it, in his country and he has done and the murder weight rate in El Salvador has gone from being one of the worst in the world, one of the most dangerous places in the world, including countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, um, to being safer than many European countries in terms of violent crime. Yet the West does not know how to deal with these countries. Like both AMLO and Bukele, despite the fact they ought to be natural allies of the United States, and you would have thought that the United States, no matter what methods they were using, would be delighted that the lives of people in these countries was improving. Because when the lives of people in these countries gets really bad, they all rush across the Rio Grande into America and cause all kinds of political and social problems for US politicians. And yet, they're not supportive at all in Washington. It's very strange. But I do think that ultimately... I mean, Bukele might have an easier job, but Scheinbaum certainly has her hands full because it's not just one or two disputes that she's got with America. It's a lot. And while they're not making news, while they haven't got nasty yet, she's going to have to find a way of ameliorating Washington in some way. Um, and I think Washington is going to have to find a way to be careful here because it do, you know, while it is way more powerful than Mexico, while it can really throw its weight around a bit, if it goes too far, if it gets too heavy-handed, it does not want a kind of enemy or like a seething, angry country that is getting richer actually pretty quickly. You know, it's a third-world country that's coming from a low base and is in that kind of catch-up growth phase. It's it's not Asian tiger territory yet, but it is getting richer. The U.S. doesn't want a kind of enemy on its doorstep or, or bad feeling on its doorstep at all. So I think this is a very interesting um, example of some of the things that are going on in, in you know in South America. You've, you've, you've got Malay in Argentina, you've got Lula, you've got Bukele, and now you've got uh, Scheinbaum, all populists. And then you know while perhaps Lula isn't tearing up any trees and. Millet, the jury is still very much out in terms of his potential for success. Bukele and Ms. Scheinbaum's predecessor, ALM, uh, you know, ALMO, had real success. And it wasn't applauded, it wasn't even supported by Washington, which is surprising to me. Uh, but there are still disputes, and those disputes will rumble on. And I think as we move into a multipolar world in which great power security competition – 
starts to become increasingly important, these kinds of relationships will be very important as well. Buyout Britain. The story about Buyout Britain, as it were, is almost as interesting in the way that it's been covered uh, as in the actual story itself. It's kind of one of those stories. Because the ultimate story, as we'll see, is basically that America are taking over large swathes of what's left of British businesses. But the way that it's been highlighted in the press has not been to highlight that, as it were. So the Financial Times story on this, the title is Hedge Fund Short Sellers Burnt by Flurry of UK Takeover Bids. I just said hedge fund short sellers burnt by flurry of vulture funds, but that's just me. The Basically, what was happening was there were a bunch of hedge funds that were short selling British mid cap businesses. And the reason for this is that British businesses aren't doing well at the moment, the economy is not doing well, and so on. And so they, they were shorting them. And, and the underlying um, issue here is basically, um, if anyone knows anything about stock markets, they'll know valuations um, are basically a way of saying that the, uh, the price of a stock relative to the underlying earnings of the company. So it kind of measures how much you're paying for the earnings. And you can judge it whether it's um, cheap or expensive on that basis. The valuations on British businesses have been driven very low both by um, people pulling money out of the country, uh, also British people pulling, pulling money out of the domestic stock market and sending it abroad, but also by short sellers. Um, and basically, the reason for this, so this has given rise to price-to-earnings ratios that are far, far below um, America, and I think they're even pretty much below uh, Europe at the moment. And that's quite surprising, because if you know anything about the history of the UK stock market, it tended to be kind of wedded at the hip to the American stock market. And the British finance uh, industry and the British financial sector was always seen as more an outpost of New York than it was related to kind of more social democratic Europe. Well, all that's changed. Britain is now cheap. It's got cheap stocks. It's got cheap companies. And there are a million different reasons for that. We go into them all the time on the show. Last week, we had a a special on uh, Doomer Britain. So you'll probably get some, some hint of it from that as well. So what's happening is the short sellers are now pulling out, according to this this article in the Financial Times, because they're getting burned because these American firms are going in and they're they're buying up they're buying up these companies and they're buying up these companies because they're so cheap. They're just so cheap. I mean, the earnings are there and the price is so low. Now, what that usually means is that future earnings are thought to be pretty dismal. But at a certain point, the stock becomes so cheap that it's worth buying. And it seems that they're reaching those levels in Britain. It's mainly driven through mergers and acquisitions, as far as I can see. And in 2023, uh, mergers and acquisitions involving a UK target rose 84%, which is quite a lot. And basically, this is American companies, looks like mainly private equity, really, going in and buying up these cheap, mid-sized British companies and smushing them into a portfolio. It feels to me, I mean, we can talk about it in more detail, the whole process of buying up um, buying up companies and so on is really interesting, the whole process of America buying up companies. But in, in the case of Britain especially, this definitely feels, because as I said, the, the price-to-earnings ratios have never really been this low, as far as I know, relative to America. This feels like kind of a new wave of American buyouts of British companies. And I do wonder if if this might not be looked upon. And I don't think it'll be just now. I think it'll be especially in the next recession, uh, if there's a financial crisis coming up, et cetera, et cetera. I wonder if this will be seen as perhaps the start of the final wave of, Brit- of American companies, of American investors, in fact, of American investors and companies buying out British industry. It's starting to feel that way. Yeah, I do fear. Uh, I mean, I'm sure macroeconomists would scoff at this, but I do fear the effect that this has on the British economy and British society. It's possible to see that when foreign companies buy a local company, it does have potentially negative effects. For instance, there might be duplicate uh, duplicate, duplicated jobs and roles between the purchasing company and the purchased company. There might be duplicate, a duplicate, say, research center, R&D center. There might be duplicated personnel department, whatever. 
what happens there is that you lose those jobs in your country, but they're kept in the host country because the company that's buying has a kind of a tie to their own country, but not to yours. To your country, they're there to make money, okay? And you see this all of the time. You see it happening regularly. You also see, you know, far less interest, for instance, in like, I don't know, like local community and, 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 you know, keeping the business there, there's less of a tie to the local area that's, you know, cause there's no history at all. And I know, you know, economists scoff at that, but it can lead in some cases. And it has led in some cases in Britain to the loss of skills and also to manufacturing clusters. You know, you get these kind of like supply chain effects and clus- and, and, and therefore clustering effects where you get a certain kind of critical mass of, of, of skilled labor in a particular area and a, uh, you know, certain companies that provide the main company that's been bought. Um, and, and, and over time you lose that as the, co- as the purchasing company tries to rationalize. Now this might be all private equity. That's, you, you know, oh, well not private equity, but it might all be institutional investors like family offices and funds and all of the rest of it buying into UK equities, right? Which will be a different thing altogether. But, that also does bring its own issues as well. And again, it, it 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 gets back to just how linked they are, whether they feel any loyalty to the local country, whether they feel any any responsibility to that country. And you can see in countries like Germany, for example, and France and South Korea, where there are real national companies and real national champions, and 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 they're even protective of their, you know, in Germany, like the Mittelsrand, for instance, the family-owned medium to large-ish companies. During difficult times and recessions, the government can work with those companies who are German. They do their business in Germany. They have the history in Germany. They want to stay in Germany. And they can't do business to kind of like work on some kind of you know counter-cyclical landing softening measures to make sure uh, the effects of a recession don't necessarily hit workers and hit individuals and hit the economy as a whole, as it might have. Uh, a mercenary company where everything is owned by foreigners is, is is not going to have that same effect. The other issue I have is just the kind of the leverage it gives a foreign country over your country. It's like if, if everything in your country is owned by a foreign country, that, I mean, it might be old fashioned to think this way, but that kind of gives them a, a, a rather a, a big say in how you run your own country. Does it not? Can you pass laws? I mean, the U.S. is a really much more powerful country than Britain, like way more powerful. So if we pass a law that is going to affect like a whole bunch of U.S. companies in a negative way, are we really going to be able to pass that law? Or will those companies in America just lobby Washington and then Washington drop a ton of bricks on whichever British government is in control at the time and wants to pass this law and the law gets nixed? America's influence over Britain in that sense is already like way outsized. So if America owns like the entirety of Britain in terms of its corporate space, then you'd have to imagine it, it gets pretty bad. I mean, for instance, we have issues with our water companies at the moment. Like they have underinvested over the years. There's massive, massive issues with them dumping raw sewage into rivers and onto beaches. And they get fined all the time for leakages. They've underinvested, but they've also kind of financially engineered themselves so that they've taken on a whole bunch of debt. And at the minute, they can't really afford to invest. So they're asking, they're lobbying the government to allow them to increase water rates, the amount of money people pay for their water and sewerage every month. Now, if all those companies were American and and, and they were able to lobby the US government effectively, and then lobbying is, as far as I understand, dollar for dollar, extremely effective on the Hill in Washington, then... You know, how does that affect our democracy? How does that affect our legislative and decision making process? I think this is like a much more important story than the economists really talk about. Maybe I haven't put it well, but those are my instincts on the matter, Philip. The way you think about this often is if a com if a company is employing people in a given country, it doesn't really matter what the foreign ownership structure is, because the GDP is being generated in that country, okay, some of the profits are going abroad, but there's global ownership of everything anyway, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the kind of base case of it. Now, there's a lot of truth to that, but I tend to agree with you. I think that there's, um, I think that there's a political dimension to it and a social dimension 
that is a little is a little thicker than that. Um, just to give some idea, look, foreign ownership of, of of companies in smaller countries is almost inevitable. So if you look at the data, the highest share in the European data, at least, um, of a country with with a, a foreign ownership is Ireland, and it's immediately followed by Hungary, Slovakia, Romania. Right? These are all relatively small countries. A lot of them are kind of developing. Ireland's not, obviously, but the rest of them are. And when you're a country like that, of say less than 10, 15 million people, Romania is a little larger, but it's been very poor up until recently, you don't really have much choice but to allow multinationals to come in and park themselves on your turf and make components for cars in Slovakia and Hungary, do tech stuff in Ireland, et cetera, et cetera. And that's most of that investment or most of that foreign ownership is usually a subsidiary of a very large multinational company. Now, when it comes to a mid-sized economy like Britain, you're not really talking about that when you see foreign ownership. You're talking about something different. The vast the, When you see an awful lot of um, British companies being owned, foreign owned, and I'll go into the data in a minute, I don't think you're seeing the same thing. I don't think you're fundamentally seeing the same thing. They're not just subsidiaries of a large multinational because if a subsidiary of a large multinational goes into a small country like Ireland or Hungary, They just immediately suck up a a very large share of the value added or whatever the metric is. I mean, it's just natural because the country is so small. But with Britain, it's a relatively large country. It's a mid-sized country. It's nearly 80 million people. And so when you see very high rates of foreign ownership there, it's it's actually far more probable. And in the case of Britain, I think you are seeing this. It's far more probable that you're seeing British companies actual British companies that are just foreign owned. And I feel that's a very different dynamic to the multinationals. So in terms of the in terms of the data itself, Britain is already, and I've only sadly got 2017 data, and the reason is because Britain left the EU and so the Eurostat data is not very up to date. But I think in relative terms, at least until now maybe, it's pretty reliable. Britain is substantial, you know, it's in the high end for mid-sized country that has large amounts of foreign ownership. It looks like it's pushing about 30% of foreign ownership. That's in 2017. I'd imagine it's up significantly since then, probably over 30%. Germany gives it a run for its money. I'm surprised at how much how much foreign ownership is in Germany. Although, again, I'll highlight, although Germany's a mid-sized country, it's very manufacturing heavy. So I wonder if a lot of that isn't the same multinational dynamic. For example, Germany's quite competes in terms of its foreign ownership with Sweden. Again, uh, it's a manufacturing economy there. So you might be dealing with subsidiarities of, of, of multinationals, which feels to me like a very different thing than selling your own family silver. But the thing is that I, the UK, as I said, is already standing out as a mid-sized country that has an awful lot of foreign ownership. And it feels to me that with these low valuations at the moment and the ease of capital, remember, look, the EU has open capital flows. I get it. But the UK has historically been and still is and is correctly perceived as a much more kind of free market oriented country. So to go in there and snap up businesses is probably an easier process if you're an American than to go into the EU. And with those lower valuations, which again, I I, I want to stress, usually those valuations should have been pegged to New York valuations in some shape or form. With these structurally lower valuations, I don't see much preventing floods of capital from coming in and scooping up loads of British businesses, probably mainly through private equity. I've heard this in private channels as well. When the war took place and the energy started really crushing Europe, I think American investors got an idea in their head that they'd go in and they'd buy the place up cheap. I think the easiest one to do that with, because of regulations, because of similarity of culture, because of this tendency to try and be free market and open to capital flows and so on, I think the UK is a very, very obvious target in that regard. What does it mean? I mean, you could go full like doom on it and say the global liberal order is effectively collapsing. The EU is kind of an entity unto itself. It's still trying to define itself. Maybe it goes with the kind of global global, glo- global um, liberal model, the Anglo model, whatever you want to call it, the Atlantis model, I think we sometimes call it, or maybe it doesn't. 
Whereas Britain just kind of seems stuck. I mean, this is this has been my sense from Britain from a number of points of views. That Britain, um, Britain just feels stuck, and it doesn't really feel like it has a choice here. And maybe it's got itself put in this position where uh, the historical relationship that they build with America since the Second World War has always been unbalanced. But Britain's been able to maintain some sort of identity or place for itself within that system. And as that place kind of falls apart, which it has with the exodus of of New York style money from Britain at similar valuations or the importance of the um, city of London as a financial hub, which is declining no matter what anyone tells you. um, As those things fade away, maybe Britain starts to just become absorbed into the American blob. And that's a real concern. The last thing I'd say on it is that there's nothing preventing countries from stopping foreign ownership of their companies. So just to give an example, France has one of the lowest foreign ownership of their companies in Europe. And that's a conscious strategy on the part of the French. It's a kind of sovereigntist economic model. The French want to keep, for the most part, their companies in French hands. Has it really impacted the French economy? I doubt it. It, 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 will somebody come to me and say, well, if only France hadn't been so stubborn about foreign ownership of its con- companies, its GDP would have grown substantially faster. I've never seen that case made. And I'd be very, very skeptical if somebody came along and made that case. Maybe somebody would say, oh, well, FDI is not going to be as high. But if you know anything about uh, FDI statistics, FDI really only drives, really drives growth. In smaller countries, and again, that's back to the multinational model of Ireland and Hungary and Slovakia and so on. That's a totally different thing. But I don't think there's a very credible case to make that France has vastly underperformed economically because it's decided to keep its um, its companies held domestically. So that's probably worth thinking, uh, keeping in mind. But it'll be very interesting watching Britain moving forward. Has it got itself caught in this, this trap of its alliance with America post-45? I think there's multiple indications uh, there's multiple indicators pointing in that direction. Yeah, just to add to that very briefly, I, regarding foreign direct investment, FDI, I think there's a real difference between FDI like Nissan did in the, I think, 80s or early 90s, where Britain's car industry was completely collapsed by that stage. We produced very little that was very decent. And we also had a lot of unemployment, especially in the north of England. And Nissan, the Japanese car company came in to Britain and built and opened a plant in Sunderland, which was one of the most deprived and poor areas within the United Kingdom. Uh, It trained up a workforce and it stayed there and it became a very successful business. That sort of FDI is great. It brings with it high quality jobs. It brings with it training. It creates something new it has some kind of like technology transfer as well, like de facto. If you, I mean, I'm, you know, I make it sound like they they brought with them quantum computing or something. You know, I know that building cars might not sound the most glamorous technology transfer, but it's not easy either, as as we're finding out these days. So, I, you know, I, I I see a real worth to that sort of FDI, but if it's just some kind of vulturing American multinational or private equity or hedge fund or institutional investor who sees in the old Warren Buffett's uh, terms, you know, a cigar butt with one or two puffs left in it. And, you you know, it it sees that the the PE of a specific stock or the balance sheet cash position of of like a, a large private company is worth more than the actual selling price, then... I'm not sure that's great. I recommend listeners look up an old book from, I want to say like 2011. I think I read it about 10 years ago, about 2014, 2015. And it's called Britain for Sale. It's a very easy book to read. It's written by an economics journalist called Alex Brummer. And he looks at this and and especially looks at the, the sale of Cadbury, which was really an iconic chocolatier in Britain. People know Cadbury all over the world, and, and and it was bought by Kraft, which was one of the you know one of the big U.S. food mega giants, and it it caused a whole range of of, of problems, and, and it caused a lot of outcry because Kraft seemed to reverse a lot of their promises very quickly. But Brummer goes through a lot of the 
the social and political issues and and some of the the economic issues that these these sorts of foreign purchases can cause. Um, and he says so far better and more concisely than than, than I have. And it's very much worth reading because it does cause more of an issue, even in economic terms, than a lot of the kind of the 10,000 foot high view macroeconomists care to admit. And I agree 100% with you. Like, is anybody really saying that if the French had sold Danone after all and hadn't quite ridiculously classified it as a yogurt making as a strategic industry, that the French economy would be like awesomely dynamic now? I'm not altogether sure. Like, I think economic dynamism is probably ultimately about how productive you are. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's as simple as that. Do you have high productivity as an, uh, as an economy? And, and like, is productivity continuing to grow? It's not about having like, you know, loads of multinationals running your economy. It's not about having like a super flexible workforce, which was the other tenant of the economic model that we've adopted but anyway i'm I'm, I'm digressing here i I agree with you 100 percent, philip i think it is an issue and i think ultimately it's going to be extreme you know britain's defense links our lack of indigenous defense because of underinvestment and appalling procurement practices um and 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 just britain's involved america's involvement in the you know the british economy it kind of makes it inevitable that we're, you know, when push comes to shove, when the chips are down, we will, you know, go into America's gravity. We will fall into America's gravity well, and that'll be that. We're kind of already in the gravity well. We just haven't realised that we can't escape yet. Ankara's away. Imagine my shock. Uh, today I opened up my iPhone, and uh, if you scroll to the right, I believe, you see uh, Apple News, and usually Apple News is carefully curated for, um, you know, for the average Apple consumer, as Tim Cook imagines, uh, I suppose. Um, so you're used to getting some liberal cultural stuff there, some, you know, breaking news, whatever. Anyway, what do I see but an article from Reuters saying Kremlin welcomes Turkey's reported desire to join the BRICS. So I think we can officially say, first of all, that multipolarity has come to Apple News, along with, um, you know, something about genders. So that's great. Um, We can all be kind of happy about that. Although the headline itself is very interesting. Kremlin welcomes Turkey's reported desire to join BRICS. Well, Kremlin's bad. We know Kremlin's coded bad these days. So that's kind of interesting. Are we seeing, I wonder, and we'll get into the story in a moment, but even the way it's presented is interesting. Are we seeing the so-called mainstream media start to um, absorb some of what's actually happening in the world, i.e. the transition to multipolarity? Are they starting to see, for example, the importance of the BRICS? And then, inevitably, coding it negatively, associating it with Russia, associating with the Kremlin. I don't know. This is the first time I've seen it. So it's very interesting even in that regard. More interesting, and highlighting that point, the story itself really doesn't have a great deal to do with the Kremlin. It has to do with the fact that the Turkish foreign minister, Hakan Fidan, uh, began a visit to Beijing on Monday of this week. And um, he's the highest level uh, Turkish official to, to, visit, um, to visit China since 2012. So this is kind of a, a big meeting. It comes on the back of a bunch of of uh, Chinese diplomacy. I mean, <laughs> everything's Chinese diplomacy these days, but we know about the Xi Jinping visit to Europe. Uh, then there was the meeting between, uh, the, the bro hug meeting between Xi and Putin and so on. So there's a flurry of activity going on here and Turkey seems to be there too. Um, so it was actually in, in at a talk at the Center for China and Globalization in China on Monday that uh, Fidan, the foreign minister, was asked if um, if he'd want to join the BRICS. And he said, we would like to, of course. Why would we not? Um, then the uh, Kremlin spokesperson came out probably at a random Q&A and somebody asked him what, they, what he thought of it. And we get our headline from Reuters. So kind of interesting even to see how the reporting on this is being done. As we move into a multipolar world and it becomes impossible to continue this kind of cope mechanism, the bricks aren't real and the multipolarity isn't happening. Maybe we just blame it all on the Kremlin. 
threads under the bed all over again. We'll see. It might be going in that direction. In terms of the actual um, concrete proposal, um, uh, as Andrew, you've pointed out to me in the uh, in the backroom chat. Uh, Turkey often talks about these things and then doesn't follow through on them. Um, Erdogan actually uh, declared his country's uh, intention to join the BRICS six years ago at Johannesburg. Now, my my reading of um, this, there's a very good article, much better than the Reuters article, on the uh, South China Morning Press, which really is um, a must-read paper for kind of diplomatic issues. It's, it's, it's always been very high quality in that regard. I wouldn't say it explains, but it strongly hints at the fact with good reporting to back it up, that, you know, when Erdogan was saying that six years ago, and even potentially when Fidan is saying this in uh, in China today, it's all about trying to figure out whether they want to go in the European Union direction or in another direction. And that um, articulating a desire to join the BRICS, for example, might be a way to kind of not bully, but kind of prod the Europeans and say, maybe maybe you guys would like to take us on now, because obviously Turkey have been trying to join the EU for a very long time. During the dialogue, this is what the South China Morning Press says, uh, Fidan said that, um, that's the foreign minister, Fidan said uh, China backed BRICS group and could offer Turkey a good alternative to the European Union. So there is a little bit of that kind of, you know, trying to put jealousy traps around and so on. I would say six years ago, when Erdogan is saying this in Johannesburg, um, yes, I do think that probably is to put a little bit of leverage on the EU to try and get EU membership. I would not read that in as simple terms today. The BRICS has changed an awful lot. We discuss it on the show all the time. And at this point, I think Turkey will be will be fairly mad not to at least consider joining the BRICS. I think also the, the European Union for Turkey has been off the table for a long time. And I think the Turks are pretty smart diplomats, actually, from everything that I can see. I think they're very shrewd. And if they don't understand that the European Union thing not happening anytime soon, you know, it's not happening in the next five years. It's probably not happening in the next 10 years. Maybe, I suppose, if you're really optimistic and you're Turkish and you really want to join the EU, you could say it's going to happen in the next 20 years. They could join the BRICS next year. Turkey is a huge economy. Of course, they'd have them. And obviously, the Chinese have signaled it and the Russians have signaled it. So, of course, they have Turkey. It's a really important transport hub. And we can talk about that more. Anyway. So, I think I would take this much more seriously than, for example, uh, Erdogan saying it six years ago in Johannesburg just because the nature of the BRICS has changed. And I think it's really become clarified that the EU thing may be a, a bit less of an non-starter. Also, of course, pile on top of that, Europe is looking not great these days because of energy and so on. I'm not saying it's not worth joining the EU for Turkey. It might be open to discussion. But, um, but you know, it, it does look slightly less um, slightly less appealing than it would have maybe, as I said, six years ago um, when Erdogan's in, in Johannesburg. Obviously, the final thing uh, to mention is... I'm sure everybody knows Turkey's a NATO member. And I think that will be the first NATO member that joined BRICS. And there shouldn't be a problem with that because BRICS is not a geopolitical uh, or a military alliance. It's a it's an economic alliance, first and foremost. It's it's very similar to the G7. That's the kind of template of the BRICS, and that's the self-conscious template. And there's no G7 army. Like I suppose there's NATO and it's tied, but there's no G7 army. So there's no actual problem with NATO joining the BRICS, but that loops back to the headline that I started with, where there, you know, we're trying. Maybe we in the West are going to start trying to code uh, BRICS as related to the Kremlin and therefore a geopolitical rival or something like that. But I think they're going to have a very hard time with that because BRICS just isn't that, and I don't think it's ever going to be that. Now, if there was ever a global conflict or anything, BRICS I think would become very important because of the trading relations that it would solidify in order to um, to facilitate that global conflict. And we're already seeing something of that in the Ukraine war, in Russia, China, the sanctions and so on. We talk about it all the time. To be clear, I think that Turkey has all the reason in the world to join BRICS. Turkey traditionally, I mean, just because of Turkey's location in the world traditionally, it has had a huge amount of room and a huge plethora of directions for uh, strategic movement. It borders the Balkans, it borders the Middle East, it borders the Caucasus. All of these are geostrategically extremely important and, of course, extremely dangerous and difficult uh, places. But it's also, it, it, you know, it also sits on that great trading crossroads of the world between the Mediterranean, which has always been 
a sea across which uh, and around which uh, vast wealth has been located. And of course, the Black Sea as well, which is one of the great trading basins in the world, uh, transporting the great um, commodities, wealth uh, from Russia uh, into Europe and, and farther and to the Middle East and Africa as well. Turkey is in a very important strategic location. I mean, ultimately, depending on how powerful Turkey gets, it, it, it develops vast empires, as we saw with the Ottoman Empire. You know, traditionally, it was the great power of that part of the world. Uh, it's also possible to imagine if it became similarly powerful again, it moving eastward and northward into, you know, toward the great Turkic populations of, of the Caucasus, Central Asia, and the Volga River in Russia. Turkey has a, a, a pretty big canvas upon which it likes to draw, and I think it makes a lot of sense for a country like Turkey uh, to join a, a club like BRICS for that reason, not because it, you know it wants to it wants to capture Tatarstan or Kazakhstan or something like that. It's not what I mean that it you know it wants to build relations on a global scale because Turkey is a kind of global country traditionally. Oh, not a global country, but a great Turkey is a big player traditionally, and I think it makes sense. It, it also makes sense at the moment as well because Erdogan, certainly since it became clear that European membership wasn't on the table and that the farthest they're ever going to go is their is their present membership of the European Customs Union, which is extremely useful for them because it allows them to be a car manufacturing hub, among other things. As soon as that became clear, Erdogan has done a very good job in terms of balancing between East and West. And he's been in his element, really, since uh, February 2022, when he has been courted both by Russia and the European Union for help from Russia's side in circumventing uh, European Union sanctions and from the European Union side in cracking down on Russia's circumvention of sanctions. And he's managed to extract from the EU, from Russia, and from the US as well, a range of uh, concessions. So I think it makes it makes sense for them to get involved in BRICS. Let's not forget, BRICS isn't an analog of NATO. BRICS isn't an analog of the International Monetary Fund. BRICS is really an analog of the G7. BRICS is, a, is a, at present at least anyway, is an analog of the G7. It's a place where the leaders or finance ministers or, or foreign ministers of those countries can get together, they can meet, and they can discuss and try to solve issues and problems of common interest to them. There are moves to use that as a platform to build things like development banks, which could eventually compete with the World Bank, of potentially developing a monetary system for trading purposes at least, uh, which could ultimately compete with the IMF and even uh, king dollar itself but at the moment it's a competitor for the g7 so i think it makes a lot of sense for turkey to get involved for it to be able to build links with china with whom it already has surprisingly strong economic links with russia with whom it must always maintain strong relations even when it's at russia's throat and russia's at its throat it's important to keep itself close to russia um, and some of the other countries that are involved. But let's not forget, as you said, uh, I'm always questionable about Erdogan. He uh, does like to play um, one power off another. Uh, he does like to do it in a very overt way. He kind of like the kind of like the man who likes to seduce women and likes to make it really obvious <laughs> what he's doing. Um, and he has been known on many occasions in the past to say that he's going to do one thing uh, only to accept a concession for somebody else from somebody else and to walk it back. Not sure how much he's going to get to back off bricks, but let's be clear here. This, something happened with the Saudi membership. The Saudis were going to join BRICS. They were all for it. They said they were going to join. BRICS as an organization said that Saudi had accepted the invitation to join and then they didn't. And then it all went quiet. Why is that? Could something similar happen to Turkey? Anyway, I think it's a great idea for Turkey. Whether it ultimately happens, I don't know. But it's certainly worth following because as BRICS gets a kind of critical mass of countries, and Turkey is 
Not an insignificant country, by the way. It has a decent-sized population. It's had a whole range of economic problems recently, uh, like in part, I have to say, because of Mr. Erdogan's, shall we say, unorthodox economic and monetary management of the economy. But it has tremendous uh, economic and geostrategic potential. So I think it would be a, ultimately a valuable addition to BRICS. You've been listening to Multipolarity. Subscribe or follow for fresh episodes every week.